Sponsored by Dykes Library and co-sponsored by all the schools, schools health professions, nursing, and medicine. Thank you so much. I also want to thank the organizers of today, Terry Harrisman, Rachel Lucas, Kevin Viola Douglas, Sarah Motzinger, and Heather Collins. They organized this, got us our lunches and drinks, and uh, got Kevin to show up here. So, uh, thank you all for that. So um, let me give you a quick introduction to our, our speaker today. Um, Kevin Smith is the Dean of Libraries at the University of Kansas. Uh, he got that job, uh, I heard, a week, a uh, year and a week ago, so uh, in 2016. After 10 years as Director of Copyright and Scholarly Communications at the Duke University Libraries, as both a librarian and a lawyer specializing in intellectual property issues, Smith's role at Duke was to advise faculty, staff, and students about the impact of copyright, licensing, and the changing nature of scholarly publication um, in higher education. Prior to that, Smith was the Director of the Pilgrim Library at Defiance College in Ohio, where he also taught constitutional law. His teaching experience in ver is various, having taught courses in theology, law, and library science. Smith is the author of numerous articles on the impact of copyright law and the internet uh, on scholarly research, as well as library's role in the academy. He's been a highly regarded blogger on these issues for many years, and in 2013 published Owning and Using Scholarship, an IP handbook for teachers and researchers with the Association of College and Research Libraries. He holds a BA in Hamilton College in Clinton, from Clinton, New York, an MA from Yale Divinity School, and an MLS from Kent State University, and a JD from Capital University. He did doctoral work in theology and literature at the University of Chicago. So, um, without it, this is Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Thank you. When you put it all together like that, it sounds awfully chaotic. I think I should probably use this, so I'll clip it there and see if that works. Good afternoon. I really appreciate the invitation to come and talk to you. Uh, the presentation I'm giving is a slightly modified version of a presentation I gave for Fair Use Week uh, in the Watson Library at the Lawrence campus. So um, I'm fo mostly focused on fair use. I'll try and talk about some other issues a little bit. I also want to say I am very bad at leaving time at the end. So if I say something that prompts a question, I really want to encourage you to just raise your hand, throw something at me, a uh, cookie if you want, um, and I will try to answer it at the time. I also, Heather, can I bother you to do me a favor? I want to pass these out. This is a handout that I will explain in just a few slides. Thank you. So fair use trending. Um, I think it's important to realize that in the past decade or so, we have seen significant, well, that's not going to work, significant advancements in fair use law in ways that have a significant impact on how we think about copyright in the classroom. So that's going to be my theme. I'm standing on the cord here, which is kind of what the problem is. There we go. <laughs> OK. Hello. So let me get started. Um, and yes, I am a lawyer and a librarian, uh, which is a very strange combination, but actually quite useful these days. So transformation. Transformation is the key to contemporary fair use jurisprudence. That is the way courts make decisions about what is or is not fair use. They look for uses that are transformative. And transformation in this context is easier than turning a rodent into a water goblet, which is what's going on there, for those of you who remember Harry Potter. Um, Studies have shown, there have been empirical studies that have shown that when a court finds that a use was transformative, it's overwhelmingly likely to rule ultimately in favor of fair use. The interesting thing is that when the court does not find that a use was transformative, fair use is still possible. And that's because the Supreme Court, when they outlined the analysis of transformational use, specifically said something can still be fair use if it's not transformative. I will talk to you more about that as we go on. I love this analogy. This actually comes from a colleague, longtime law professor at UNC, Lolly Gassaway, who always said that fair use is like making soup. 
That is, there is no perfect recipe. There is no, it has to have this and it can't have that. It is a matter of mixing together a bunch of facts until it tastes like fair use, uh, kind of the way you make soup. Every other exception in the copyright law, so there's an exception that lets you show a movie in a class. There's an exception that lets you take a picture of a copyrighted building on the street. Um, there are all kinds of specific exceptions in the law. And all of them apply to very defined situations, and they have sort of checklists of requirements. If you do X, Y, and Z, or if the facts are X, Y, and Z, you're okay. You can take advantage of the exception. Fair use is not like that. There are four factors in fair use. They are not requirements, and the courts balance them. Right? You have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. That's how you make soup. There is no, you have to have three out of the four. You have to have all four. You can get fair use if you only have one, um, depending on the circumstances. So it really is an inquiry into what are the facts, and do we think this is fair? Does it ultimately taste right? Um, this reminds me to say, I get teased a lot, and all lawyers do, because when we're asked a question, very often we say some version of, it depends. Right? It depends. That's the usual lawyer's answer. Do you know what it depends means? It means two different things, and they're both relevant here. One is, it means you haven't given me enough facts yet. I need to know more about the circumstances of your situation. And fair use is extremely fact determinant. You have to know the circumstances. The fair use factors are really just inquiries into the specific circumstances of the use. So it depends means you haven't given me enough facts. It depends also means you have to make a decision here. Fair use is really about risk. Um, do I feel confident enough in this use that I'm willing to make it? Or is there such a great risk of what I'll lose if I don't do this? Will my teaching really suffer? Um, that you balance the two risks. Okay, I might get sued. People in universities almost never do. So there's a fairly small chance, but there's a chance. On the other hand, there's the risk that my teaching will suffer. So how do I balance those? That's not something the lawyer can do for you. That's ultimately the decision that you make based on yours and your institution's risk tolerance. So it depends means two things. I need more facts, and ultimately it's got to be your decision. So, the handout that just went around is an expanded version of this. And this is a framework that I and some colleagues developed for analyzing any, fair, any copyright issue, any issue where you want to use something that belongs to someone else, where someone else may, may hold a copyright. And it's five questions. They're explained in more detail in the handout. But the five questions, the important thing about them, none of them are easy questions. They can all be quite difficult to answer. The important thing about them is the order, because if you have a copyright issue and you walk through them in this order, you'll be able to identify what the facts are that are really important. So the first thing you ask is, is the work I want to use in the public domain? Lots of things are. Um, a lot more than you think. A lot of people know that anything that was published before 1923 in the United States is in the public domain. But there is a whole lot of stuff that is newer than that that is also in the public domain. For a long time, copyright had to be renewed. And if it wasn't renewed, things went into the public domain. Works of the United States government, works of government employees that are created during the scope of their employment or within the scope of their employment, are in the public domain. So a report from an EPA scientist is very likely in the public domain. So there's a lot in the public domain. It's a difficult and complicated question. But if you find that something is in the public domain, you don't have to ask the rest of the questions. Um, your use is, is allowed, because anybody can do anything 
with a work that's in the public domain. It is as free as the air we breathe, as somebody once said. Second question, is there a license related to my use? If you get an article from one of the databases that the libraries subscribe to, there will be a license. Or you can go out, you need an illustration, you can go out and look for something that has a Creative Commons license on it that permits you to do that. So a license will inform you. Is there a specific exception in the law? I just told you about a couple of them. There are a lot. There are about 24 separate specific exceptions in the law. And then there's fair use, which is a general sort of catch-all exception to copyright. That is, it lets you do something without asking the copyright owner. Um, so specific exception, then fair use. If the answer to all of these questions, it's not in the public domain, there's no license, there's no specific exception, and I don't think it's fair use, you can always ask permission. And permission solves most questions. So these five questions in this order are a really helpful way, I hope, to analyze any copyright problem. So let's talk about fair use, because that's where the action is, really, for a lot of academic uses. Since fair use is like soup, the best way to learn to make it is to look at the recipes, or in this case, look at the cases, because the cases tell us how courts think about fair use. So what is a transformative fair use? The classic case from the Supreme Court in 1989, 1990, I don't know, uh, sorry, is Campbell versus A. Cuff Rose. And this involved a rap group. Some of you may be old enough to remember that at one time the group Two Live Crew was controversial. Uh, they were controversial because what, they were one of the first commercial groups to use explicit language in their music which now seems quite quaint. But, uh, but in, in a version of an album that they released that did not use explicit language, their, their uh, best known album was called As Nasty As We Want to Be, and they also released an album called As Clean As We Want to Be. And in that version of their music, they had a parody of the song Oh Pretty Woman. Uh, it had it wasn't explicit, it was somewhat crude, it's quite funny. Uh, it is based on Roy Orbison's song, uses a lot, uses the music and a lot of the lyrics from Roy Orbison's song, although the lyrics slowly transform. Um, a. Cuff Rose music sued Two Live Crew, Luther Campbell was the lead of Two Live Crew. Uh, by the way, Campbell asked A. Cuff Rose music for permission to make this song, and they said, Hell no, we're not going to let you make fun of this iconic American song. Classic. So he did it anyway. He got sued. Good American story. Um, and the Supreme Court found that his use was transformative. That he used the song for a specific purpose other than its original purpose. The Supreme Court said his purpose was to parody or lampoon the... Uh, I can't, the sort of romantic view of feminine beauty uh, in the song. I'm not sure that may be giving him too much credit. I think he was just trying to be funny. But uh, in any case, the court said that it was a parody. It had to use the original song in order to make fun of it. And it didn't use any more of the song than was necessary for its purpose. And that's a really important part of this analysis. They also said that having asked permission didn't do him any harm, that having asked permission did not rule out his later ability to rely on fair use. That was important. Another thing is this is the case where the Supreme Court, in a footnote, said transformation is really important. But even if something is not transformative, it may still be fair use. Let me look at two other cases. In the Bill Graham Archives versus Dorling Kindersley, uh, a publisher, Dorling Kindersley is a publisher of art books, lots of coffee table books. They, wrote, they published a book called The Illustrated Trip, A History of the Grateful Dead. And in that history, they have a timeline that runs across the bottom of several pages, and they illustrate it 
with concert posters from the dead. And you may know that the, there were never two concert posters that were alike. They were very creative. They were works of art in themselves. They are held by a group called the Bill Graham Archives. It has nothing to do with Billy Graham. It's an archive. Bill Graham was one of the managers of the Grateful Dead. Um, they asked permission to use these posters. The Bill Graham Archive said no. Or, well, they actually, they tried to negotiate a license, and the Bill Graham Archive wanted more money than Dorling Kindersley was willing to pay. They went ahead and used them. They got sued. Good American story. And again, a court, this time the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, found that it was fair use, that the posters were used for a different purpose. Even though the entire poster was reproduced, it was shrunk, but it, the entire poster was reproduced, the court said they were used as historiographic markers. That's the way judges like to talk. Um, they served a different purpose, and they didn't interfere with the market for the original. And think also about the Campbell versus Acuff Rose case. Nobody, and the court almost explicitly says this, nobody would go into a record store looking to buy Roy Orbison's Oh Pretty Woman, pick up a two live crew album, and say, oh, this'll do. Um, and likewise, nobody who is buying two live crew is likely to substitute it for Roy Orbison, or substitute Roy Orbison for it. Uh, they don't compete in the same market. And that was very important in both cases. Third one I want to tell you about is three students who sued, or their, their lawyer, the lawyer parent of one of the students, sued the company that makes the uh, turn it in software. Right? You, you, know, you, you submit a paper, and it figures out whether or not it's plagiarized. A lot of problems with that software. But copyright infringement is not one of them. These three students sued, claiming that they had tried to prevent their papers from becoming part of the archive, because that's what Turnitin does. It builds its archive by storing a copy of every paper submitted so that it can compare the next paper against that one and millions of others. Um, they didn't want them submitted. They sent an email saying, we don't want you to retain our paper. Um, Turnitin did retain their papers. They sued. The Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, Fourth Circuit, Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, found that it was transformative, a different purpose again. The entire paper was saved and used, but not for the purpose the paper was written. It was used as a grounds for comparison uh, for later submissions. Um, and again, no competition for the market, whatever market there is for essays written by high school seniors. Um, yeah, one does wonder, doesn't one? But again, no market harm. So the court says that all three of these, in the parody case, the thing itself is actually changed. In the other two, not so much. But the court says transformation doesn't have to be changing the actual thing. It can be changing the purpose. Really, there are these common elements. There's a new purpose. Arguably, there's a new meaning. Certainly, Two Live Crew's uh, version of Oh Pretty Woman has a very different meaning than Roy Orbison's. And there's not, you're not usurping a legitimate market. Those are the three things that the court says are really important when we think about transformative fair use. So I have these three questions that um, are useful for any academic use. So my, uh, my first five questions were any use at all. This is asking yourself, is what I'm doing transformative and therefore likely to be fair use? So we're in the fourth question, the fair use question. What do I ask myself? Does the material I am incorporating help me make my point? In other words, does it serve a different meaning? the meaning I'm giving it as a scholar making an argument. Will it help my readers or viewers understand my point? And then the Goldilocks question, have I used only the amount appropriate to make my point? Is the amount just right? These questions, and these are pretty simple questions, help you decide if your use of someone else's copyrighted material is transformative 
and therefore very likely to be fair use. I just want to make sure I'm not forgetting to say anything. And I did tell you that you should interrupt me with questions. So I'm stopping to see if anybody wants to do that. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. So um, you've illustrated your slides with image, several images. Great point. Um, and that's kind of one of my questions. So, and they're not, you don't need them, but they're nice. That's correct. So can you, are those all, are they all creative commons? Are they all fair use? That's a great question. Um, I am not very careful with my illustrations. I just grab them from Google Images. So they are probably not in the public domain going through the five questions. Are they licensed? Is there um, a Creative Commons license? I don't know that. So I can't, I can't rely on that. I could do that. I could get only Creative Commons licensed ones, and then I'd be fine. Third question, is there a specific exception? Yes. The exception that allows you to show a movie in a classroom says that basically any performance or display, which is what this is, in a face-to-face -face teaching situation, so it doesn't require that it be a class, uh, in a classroom or similar place devoted to instruction is permitted. So I'm permitted to display these in this setting. Um, so I think an, a specific exception applies. We will talk about fair use in a minute, but I would have a hard time in a different context. I'd have a hard time arguing that this is fair use because, as you said, they're nice. They're there to sort of catch your eye and, and help you reinforce what's on the slide, but I do not need them. In fact, I'll, t I'll give you an example. For I'll do it now rather than later because I might run out of time. Uh, when I was at Duke, we were heavily into teaching MOOCs massively open online courses. And um, foolishly, I volunteered that my office would do the copyright work for the MOOCs. So we had a professor who was teaching a class in evolutionary genetics, one of the first MOOCs that uh, Duke offered. And we went through his PowerPoint slides. And he'd done what I do, illustrated them with eye-catching images. Um, the one I remember. Probably there are people in the room who know better than I, but at some point in its history, the tomato apparently did something that was evolutionary, evolutionarily interesting. I don't know what it was. But, but Mohammed, the professor, had a picture of a table full of, um, a farmer's market table full of tomatoes, just to catch attention. So we talked to him about all of his images. Do you need this? Does this help you make your point? Exactly these questions. When he said, no, I don't care. Any picture of tomatoes will do. Then we went and found um, a Creative Commons licensed one. Because we were not using these in a face-to-face -face teaching situation, they were fine in his classroom. But when we put them up on the web and said, anybody can take this class, we knew we needed to be more careful. So that's an example of where the specific exception helped in his classroom, but we needed to find a licensed version because we didn't think we could rely on fair use for exactly the reason you're talking about. On the other hand, he had much more sort of obviously protected stuff. For example, suppose a graph or a chart from an academic article in his slides. But he talked about that particular image. He needed that image to make his argument either look at what this chart illustrates, or why is this chart wrong, why is this bad analysis, whatever it was, it was part of his argument. And even though we knew it was copyrighted by a publisher who you know, sometimes do actually sue academic institutions, we were very confident that in that situation it was fair use. And it was fair use because it met these three criteria. That's a very long answer. Was you, the answer to your question somewhere in there? I saw another hand. Yeah. If we're doing a face-to-face -face, um, interaction, and then we're also taping it, so now we're some right. it's, now it's a little bit different, right. and we're posting that recording in uh, Blackboard and encouraging students to download that information right. onto a stick drive before they leave. Right because that's the whole point, is they're going to take all of this with them instead of the 50,000 right. pieces of paper we used to give them. Do we run into that same difficulty? You do, and you probably need to make sure that you have 
that this kind of analysis is, is in your favor for any illustrations and things. Um, there is a specific exception that also allows the transmission of performances and displays. It's much, it's much more complicated than the one I just described for face-to-face -face teaching, where the only rule really is that it has to be a legal copy. Um, and it probably, it would not include encouraging the students to download and take it away with them. So you want to make sure you have a fair use argument. In other words, in those PowerPoints, and I'll tell you, when I'm asked if I'll put up, have let people put my slides up on a website, I take off the images because I don't want to have to worry about whether or not this is fair use. Um, for those kinds of slides where students are going to take them away, I would suggest that you make sure that you have a good fair use argument for the illustrations that you use and resist the temptation to you know, just use a cute picture of Harry Potter trying to turn a mouse into a goblet. Um, that's just extra. Yes, sir? Actually, good. Oh, good. good. Yeah. I have, I have a question. Um, because it's, um, and it goes with that whole, you know, the graphics and picture kind of, um, mm -hmm. kind of theme. Um, so does this material, you know, help me make my point or help viewers understand? There's one thing, you know, to be making your point, but I think there's also another thing about connecting with different learning styles mm -hmm. and, and making you more effective in your teaching. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it is visual kinds mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. images and things like that. So is there like a different set of questions for how effective are we in our, in our presentation of material? No, I don't think so. I, I, of course, the thing about fair use is it always depends. It's always about the argument you can make. Um, there are no instances that I know of, and I really want to say this, there are no instances that I know of of individual academics being sued for using material in their lectures. That would be such an extraordinarily difficult lawsuit for the rights holder to bring, so expensive and so little chance of recovering much money that uh, it, it's, I will talk about that with you, but I do want you to understand that I am talking about unicorns here. Uh, so having said that, I think these questions, especially that second question, will it help my readers or viewers understand my point? I think you still have a transformative fair use argument here because of the communicative power. And it's communicating something different than the original usually. Um, I still think you have a good fair use argument here. So if the unicorn showed up in your classroom, we'd still have an argument. Uh, and you said it's about you know something being able to be shown in a classroom. Right. And just with you know the transformative nature of what is a classroom these days, whether it's a face-to-face -face environment like this <coughs> or an online community, I mean, I just, I just have to wonder about the definition of classroom. So that word, I use that word in the context of a specific exception. Okay. You don't need to rely on fair use when you're performing or displaying something in a face-to-face -face teaching situation, not class, in a classroom or similar place devoted to instruction. That's the language that the exception uses. It's pretty broad. And I've checked this, actually. There has never been, that's been in place, by the way, since 1978. There has never been a lawsuit about that. Um, sometimes film companies or distributors will come to us and say, you need public performance rights for this movie. Well, you do if you show it out on the lawn and just invite patients' families to come out and enjoy. You do need public performance rights, but any kind of teaching situation. And again, classroom and, or similar place devoted to instruction. Could you argue that your online, I doubt it, that your online environment was a place devoted to instruction? I think the court might be literal about place. And there is another exception that allows the online performance and display. So, but I think classroom is defined pretty broadly there. <laughs> Sir? If you added a citation to that figure, as we, most of us do, if we mm -hmm. take a graph out sure. of the article, sure. we will always put the author <laughs> and the journal in the year. At right. least as a minimum. Does that protect you any further? Formally, it does not. Um, citation is not part of the fair use analysis in the United States. It actually is in the very specific educational exceptions in most of the rest of the world. Citation is a requirement. In the U.S. it is not a requirement. It does, however, and courts have acknowledged this, it does show good faith. 
It makes you a good actor. And courts like to reward good actors. So it helps, but not in a formal way. And of course, it's good scholarly practice. So you should always do it. Um, and it, yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't change the formal legal analysis. Um, but as I say, it, it makes you look more responsible, as I'm sure you are. But <laughs> the, the court would, uh, would say that that was a, a good faith action. Let me move on a little bit then. So how does this all help? And you're already illustrating that for me. Many scholarly uses of copyrighted material are transformative because the material becomes part of a new argument. It is my point now, not yours. And so this evolution, and it is that, in the way courts have approached fair use, really has significant benefit for academics. It is an acknowledgment of something that has been true throughout our history. That is that courts like what you do. It's not always true that the legislatures do, but the courts like what you do. They think you are good actors, especially if you put that citation down. Uh, they think you are good actors. The kinds of things that you do, that is teaching and research, are exactly the sorts of things that fair use was designed to support. And for that reason, a lot, this transformative analysis really helps a lot of scholarship. I want you to think what the paradigm of a transformative fair use is. It's the quotation. You never ask yourself, is it OK for me to do this? You take a couple of sentences from an article written by a colleague on the same topic, and you quote it. You do that a lot in literature reviews, for example. Um, that's, there's no other exception in the law that allows you to do that. It would be copyright infringement, except that we have fair use. This is where, as I was saying, in other countries, the citation is actually a requirement. That's allowed, of course, universally. Nobody questions the quotation. But most countries actually require the citation. You all do that. And if you don't, you should. Students sometimes forget. Um, but the quotation is the paradigmatic example of a transformative fair use. All we're doing when we talk about charts and pictures and things like that is transferring the analysis to a different format. But the analysis still works. Um, so the quotation, think about a quotation, and then ask yourself if my use of this film clip or image or chart is similar to, think about it exactly the same way you would about the quotation. Does it help support my argument? Will it help me communicate my ideas? Am I using no more than I need to? That is the classic analysis of a quotation. You don't think about it, because it's just second nature for academics. But in fact, it is the fair use analysis for a transformative use. And it works for all kinds of different formats. So this is the main point. Fair use is there to support your creativity, your free expression. One of the things fair use also does is protects the values of free expression. If you go back to the Oh Pretty Woman case, remember what I said uh, A. Cuff Rose Music responded when asked for a license? Hell no, we're not going to. I don't think they actually wrote hell no. But <laughs> we're not going to let you make fun of this classic, iconic American song. But that's exactly what two live crew wanted to do, and they're allowed to. It's protected speech under our Constitution. And fair use, the court specifically said, fair use is a safety valve for free speech. It prevents a copyright holder from censoring opinions that he or she doesn't like by claiming copyright. There are lots and lots of cases out there where people try to do that. Uh, J.D. Salinger was famous for it. Um, the Joyce estate, the estate of James Joyce was famous for it, trying to repress any kind of criticism or even just co scholarly commentary that they didn't like by claiming copyright. They lost a lot of fair use cases. Um, so it's a, that's one more thing to remember that fair use is there to support free expression. That's not a free-for-all, but when what you're using 
is an integral part of a message that you're entitled under the First Amendment to convey, fair use will help support you. One other thing that's not on my slides that I want to say about fair use, and it goes back to that telling you about how, how unlikely it is you'll get sued. I said that uh, it's unlikely that they'll recover a lot of money if they sue you. I don't mean that as a judgment on your wealth. You may be a very wealthy person. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I can't resist using two minutes to tell you, when I was in law school, I was employed, and you heard I have a background in theology, I was employed in a seminary library, and the first group of faculty I was ever invited to address, this was 15 years ago, was the faculty at the, a Baptist seminary in Philadelphia. It was then called Eastern Baptist. I think it has a different, Palmer, Palmer University uh, now. Anyway, I talking to them about, because the how likely am I to get sued question often comes up, uh, I used a phrase lawyers often use for a potential defendant that doesn't have a mu much money and where they couldn't, they being the, the plaintiff, couldn't get uh, a very substantial recovery. The phrase is judgment proof. But using that in a Baptist seminary, it meant something completely different to them. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was not a good choice of words. I said, you're judgment proof. They said, really? <laughs> Whether or not you have a lot of money and it would be worth suing you, the law actually has a provision that says when an employee of a nonprofit educational institution or library uses something under fair use and they have a good faith belief that it's fair use, even if they're wrong, the big chunk of money, what are called statutory damages, are not available. The plaintiff can't get them. So you are kind of judgment proof in the sense that it's not worth it to sue academics. Might sometimes be worth it to sue their institutions, but that's very difficult, especially when you work for a public institution. So uh, I want to convey to you that the risk here of doing the ordinary stuff that you want to do in teaching and research and publishing is actually quite low risk, and, and the law likes what you do, wants to support what you do. Now, this I, I, I put this in just for visual. Uh, this is from a case. Uh, a photographer named Richard Prince spent three years of his life living in Jamaica and taking pictures of Rastafarians. And he published a book of his photographs called Yes Rasta. A New York City appropriation artist um, and I'm sorry, it was Patrick Carew was the photographer. Richard Prince is the appropriation artist. Uh, Richard Prince took Carew's photographs and did funny things with them. He superimposed an electric, electric guitar. He put these colored lozenges on the face. I don't, uh, this is the picture I use because in almost all of his, his uh, appropriation art, he, most of what he inserted into the pictures were pictures of nude women. Um, anyway, Patrick Carew made $8,000 off of his book of photographs. Richard Prince made millions. He sold each of these. They're blown up. They've got these funny things inserted into them. He sold each of them for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Patrick Carew sued. The court said this was fair use. This is another example of transformative fair use. Actually, it wasn't sure about this particular image which is why I would rather use one of the other ones, but I don't because they're tasteless in my opinion. <laughs> um, it wasn't positive about this, but this general idea, this appropriation art, was found to be fair use, and for exactly the same kinds of reasons. Because there's transformation, because it communicates a different message uh, than the original. Actually, um, Richard Prince was not an ideal client for his lawyer because when asked on the stand what message he was trying to convey, he said, I don't know. Um, but he won anyway, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. What if, and I probably better stop here, but I'll, I'll finish this bit. What if the use is not transformative? Um, 
Yeah. There is a case currently going on against Georgia State University for distributing electronic excerpts, digitized excerpts from books is the specific uh, case, to its students using its Blackboard or whatever, Sakai, whatever um, learning management system it uses, to students. In other words, something we all do. Um, three publishers, Oxford University Press, Cambridge University Press, and Sage Publications, sued Georgia State claiming that this was a copyright infringement, that for every excerpt, and the reason we're talking about excerpts from books rather than journal articles, is that increasingly for journal articles, you can link. You know, students already have access to the articles through databases that we subscribe to. You can create links for them. So it's much harder to find allegations of copyright infringement where we have linked. So instead, the case is about excerpts from books. I want to use a chapter of this book and a chapter of that book. Um, the th three publishers sued Georgia State. They actually spent quite a bit of time looking for a defendant. Uh, they threatened Duke while I was there. Um, they ultimately chose to sue a public university, which I think was a foolish decision. And it has come back and bit them for, in a number of ways. But, the important thing is the courts so far, and this case is still going on, the courts so far have said, even, we think this use is not transformative. You're just scanning a chapter from a book. We don't think it's transformative. Now, I think there is an argument that it's transformative, but the courts have said it's not. Even so, fair use is still possible. And I told you the Campbell case said that. Um, three decisions so far. There was a trial court decision, an appellate court decision, and then a second trial court decision. Every one of those cases, decisions, has affirmed that fair use is possible for non-transformative distribution of limited amounts of uh, copyrighted content to students. Because it's not transformative, the amount becomes very, very important. Remember I told you the Goldilocks rule. If it's a transformative use, the way you judge the amount is, is it no more than was necessary to make my point? In the GSU case, the courts have said, it's got to be pretty limited. The uh, judge in the first court said 10% of the work or one chapter, whichever is less, would be considered, that would favor fair use. Remember, it's a balancing act. It's making soup. Um, the appellate court, one of the reasons it sent the case back to the trial court is the appellate court said, you shouldn't use such a mathematical analysis. You should still look at it in terms of what's the overall purpose, what are you trying to do here. Um, and the court went through a more uh, specific and less mechanical analysis and actually came back and said, there's even more of them that are fair use as far as we're concerned. The courts have found that of 75 challenged excerpts in this case, 70 in the first decision and 71 in the second decision are fair use. So they found pretty heavily for fair use in this case, even though it's not transformative. The amount is limited, and the appellate court said, take the markets really seriously here. Because unlike that parody or that history book, you are treading in the same market. So it's still possible to be fair use, even when it's not transformative. And education is the paradigmatic case. They said that in the, uh, in the Campbell case. And they said it again in this specific lawsuit. But we do have to use small, we have to be very careful about the amount that we use, not overdo it. Obviously, if you're assigning a lot from a book, you should ask students to purchase the book. Um, and there's more concern about harm to the market. So yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to stop there and take questions. I've got a couple more slides, but I think that's probably plenty. Yes, sir? There's, you know, if the students were buying these excerpts, in other words, if there was money involved. As there was with course packs in back in the day, yeah. Does that change the thinking? Absolutely. I mean, the course packs that used to be sold, 
the printed course packs, and they, we still do some of them, I think, um, they usually just paid a copyright licensing fee. And that's one of the strongest arguments that the publishers have in this case, is they were saying, in paper, you paid a licensing fee. The law isn't different just because it's digital, so why aren't you paying a licensing fee? Now, there are some answers to that. But yeah, the, the paper-based versions were different because a licensing fee was being paid. There are earlier cases that have found that it was copyright infringement to sell those course packs without paying the fee. Although there's a fascinating case going on right now. Well, it's over. Uh, same, same plaintiffs, two of the same plaintiffs, Oxford and Cambridge University Press, sued a copy shop at the University of Delhi in India for selling, essentially, you know, charging 25 cents or whatever it is, um, for copies uh, from textbooks so that people could share textbooks because textbooks are so expensive compared to the average Indian income. In Delhi, the court allowed it. They did not find copyright infringement. Now, they don't have a fair use argument. You know what they said? I love this, <laughs> this conclusion. They said the prices that publishers are charging are so high that they have priced themselves out of the market and we will not consider market harm in this case. That was amazing. Um, that was just uh, last year that the Indian High Court reached that conclusion. The publishers appealed it. It was set for a hearing in the Indian Supreme Court, and the publishers withdrew the case, apparently because they didn't want that kind of ruling to be out there. Um, so we are, that's a great example because even in places where we don't have fair use, we're beginning to see an acknowledgment that prices, that uh, you know, we're inflating the cost of education more and more, and textbook prices are part of that, and that fair use or some similar exception serves an important social end, which is education. Um, yes, ma'am. Is there? Do I have this memory that there's something about one-time use? Great question. Um, Back in 1966, I'm sure you're not, <laughs> but the law is that old. The law is that old. Back in 1966, the, uh, the House of Representatives commissioned a group to study fair use for the classroom. They came up with some guidelines. Uh, those guidelines were not the law. They were never part of the law. They were negotiated guidelines. Even some of the groups, especially the university groups that were at the table, declined to sign them. So they're not e they don't even have widespread acceptance. But somehow they sort of, they became the rule of thumb for fair use uh, in, in the absence of anything better. They had a very, very restrictive amount provision. It said no more than 10% or 1,000 words, whichever is less which is much more restrictive than what the Georgia State folks said. A thousand words is about three pages. Um, and they had this rule called spontaneity, that uh, the need for the use had to arise at a point where it was impossible to get permission. That's different than what you're talking about, but it kind of became twisted. And the conclusion, the thing that a lot of academics were told was that you can use something once under fair use, but the second time you have to get permission, the subsequent use rule. One of the advantages of the Georgia State case is that the trial court and the appellate court rejected it. They said those guidelines were meant as a minimum. They were never the ceiling for fair use. They're old. They're out of date. They don't, they don't take into account new technology. And they were never agreed to by everybody. And they're just not the law. So that rule, and libraries, a lot of libraries followed that rule and imposed it on faculty. That rule is not something you need to worry about. You need to make an individual fair use decision. But if it's fair use for one set of students in the fall of 2017, it's fair use for a different group of students in the fall of 2018. That would be my argument. I'm really glad you brought that up. Thank you. Yes, okay, so sometimes when you're creating slides, there's a table from a journal article or something that you want to use. Um, 
you adapt it and you basically say that this is adapted from and then you cite, mm -hmm. is that even worth doing or is it just as legitimate It's probably to not worth doing. Okay. You mean you're doing that because you think that gets you out of any copyright right, issues? Right, which is silly. One of the, I didn't do sort of the basics of copyright, but copyright owners get five, there's actually a sixth one, but five basic rights. They get the right to control reproduction, the making of copies, which is where we get copyright, the distribution of those copies, the public performance of their work, if it's the kind of thing that would be publicly performed, the public display of their work, if it's the kind of thing that would be displayed, and the right to make derivative works. And please don't ask me where the line is between a derivative work and a transformational use. I don't know. The courts don't know. But what you're describing is essentially a derivative work. And making a few changes just does not make any difference. You might as well use the original, cite it properly because that's good scholarly practice, and rely on fair use because you've used it in that way. Um, Right. In a in a committee where it's being seen by ten people, I wouldn't worry about that. Again, I think that's so clearly a fair use. Uh, there is also a rule. Uh, there's, this has been quite a debate in music because of music sampling, but there is a rule in the law in general and in copyright specifically called de minimis. If the use is de minimis. Uh, the court won't even hear the case. You know, you, the use is, it, is so unlikely to do any harm. I don't know whether using it in slides for a committee meeting is de minimis or not, but certainly the market harm is negligible and I wouldn't worry a lot about it. I thought you were going to ask me about making changes to something to put it on a website or something like that, and I should have said this. Um, if you're going to change it to do that, the standard for infringement is, are the two things substantially similar? So you really have to change quite a lot. In fact, you have to change enough so that it wouldn't be the same thing at all. Uh, so I, I think in general that technique doesn't work. It's much more important to think about fair use. Even if you're using it, in, fair use may be more difficult, but you, that's still what you'd have to rely on. I hate not to give you your, your full hour's worth. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly say this about um, online courses. I told you a little bit about um, using the tomatoes for a MOOC. Uh, I think for online courses, there are three significant issues. One that probably I can't deal with here, but that's the question of who owns them. Uh, and my best advice there is if you're agreeing to do an online course and you're concerned about who will own the material, if you leave and go to another institution, for example, get an agreement, get a separate signed agreement about it. That is the safest thing you can do. Uh, this, what, this bedeviled me for years at Duke because um, every situation was different. Yes, sir? Oh, OK. Um, then there are two, other, two ways to think about using copyrighted work in an online class. One is materials in a class presentation. And that's where I talk to you about the tomatoes. There I think you have a very strong fair use argument if you pay attention to the analysis of transformation that I've suggested. So the tomatoes that are just illustrative, probably not fair use. The chart that is part of your argument almost certainly fair use. So you have a lot of room for fair use in the, in the slides in the, or the videos, the presentations that are given. Distributing materials to online students. When I was at Duke, we looked at this and we thought about the Georgia State case and the others. But here, it's not a limited group of students. It's not all students who have registered. It's potentially anybody. We decided we were not going to rely on fair use uh, for the distribution of materials to the students when it was open to everybody. Um, instead, we looked for licensed materials or we sought permission, which really gets me back to those five questions. Um, all of them become important in thinking about online teaching. 
There's public domain materials you can use. There are licensed materials you can use. There is a specific exception that allows some transformation, some transmission of performances and displays, but it doesn't apply in the context of MOOCs because the class has to be limited. There is fair use and you can get permission. So those questions, the reason I wanted to talk about online cl classes is that we really get back to those questions and you can see how they really help in what is, in fact, a difficult situation because you're essentially putting your class materials out um, for the whole world. I taught two MOOCs while I was at Duke. Guess what the topics were? You're right, copyright law. Um, and we relied entirely on open access materials, materials that we could find on the open web or in repositories of institutions, except in one case, and in that case it was two chapters from a book. Uh, because copyright law is a fairly small world, I knew the author, uh, got permission from him and from his publisher. Uh, so using those questions is a good way to think through even this kind of um, complex situation. And then my last slide is ripped from the headlines. Uh, do you know that there's a, an argument going on about this statue? Um, so the statue in the back, and maybe it's hard to see, is the Wall Street Bull that has been there for 10, 12 years, something like that. And in the foreground is Fearless Girl, a statue that was erected there uh, for International Women's Day within the past year. And the uh, sculptor of the bull is arguing that placing the little girl there uh, is a derivative work, we talked about derivative works, and a violation of his moral rights. And the main thing I want to tell you about moral rights, going back to your question about citation, we ain't got them in the United States. Most countries protect moral rights, specifically the right of attribution, to have your name always associated with your work, and the right of integrity, not to have your work modified in a way that is damaging to your reputation or honor, uh, whatever that means. Um, we don't have them in the United States. There is no attribution right in the US. Uh, the exception is for a very small class of visual artists. And that's what this argument is about. But there is nothing, when you transfer your copyright to a publisher, for example, there is nothing that requires, unless it's in the contract, that your name always be associated with that work. And I do know of instances where a publisher has republished a short book as a chapter in a textbook without giving credit to the author. Um, which is to say, look at your contracts because attribution is important. It's the most important thing to academics. Um, use Creative Commons licenses when you're putting things on the web because you can enforce attribution with a Creative Commons license as a contractual matter where copyright law won't do it for you. I better stop there because I'm over time. Thank you so much for your questions.